Well, good morning and welcome again, Bethel Church family. Um, thank you for joining us today online. I am Pastor Steve, the church life pastor here at Bethel Assembly. Well, we got a taste of winter from old man winter this uh, past week, followed by some nice warm weather. But I love to have snow around Christmas time. It, it helps all the Christmas lights to be brighter. It reflects their light and it reminds us so much of the birth of Jesus. This week I looked through our planner to see how many Sundays were left in this calendar year and I found there were only five left, which means we are approaching the year 2021 very quickly. The passage today from our planner is taken from Ephesians uh, chapter 4 verses 4 to 6. Listen as I read it to you this morning. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and the Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. It would appear today that uh, Paul's favorite word in this passage is one. We live in such a pluralistic world, and uh, yet it's refreshing to know that, that we serve the only uh, true God, the one God, the God that is over all. And uh, he also makes uh, that way of salvation uh, possible, but it's through Jesus Christ, the only way the one way to the Father. Um, well, let me uh, just uh, summarize what Paul said about all the words that contain one. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and the Father of all. I trust that you are uh, thankful today that God is your Father, that He is the true God, the living God, and, uh, and He is over the body of Christ, over our church. and. Uh, I'm thankful for a church that works together in unity to serve Christ. The comments under our passage read like this, how can the body function together if there is not peace and unity? God has called us to be one and to work together to bring glory to his name. This is the way God designed it. Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for uh, your faithfulness, Lord. I thank you for our church family, for the body of Christ. And I pray that it would be our desire to work together as a, as a body to bring honor, to bring glory to your name. I know as we do that, we can accomplish much more for you. We can make a difference in our world, in our community, in our homes, in our schools, Lord, in our workplace. And so I pray that you would help us to, uh, to, to have a great desire to do that, to please you, Lord, and work together. I pray for needs today throughout our assembly as well, that you would be with those that are sick or afflicted or those that are grieving, those that have lost loved ones. Lord, whatever the need is, maybe financial, God, Lord, I pray that as we look to you, God, that you would do great things in our lives and our hearts and we would continue to look to that one hope. We would continue to have our faith placed solidly in you. So Lord, be with us now. I pray for the remainder of this service that it would also bring glory to you. I give you thanks today in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you so much. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, 
welcome. My name is Brian Warner, lead pastor at Bethel here, and we're glad that you're joining with us today. Last week, we started a series called The Good Life. I know, I know, we are more than eight months into a pandemic and waiting for a vaccine. Bad and unfortunate stuff has happened. There has been unprecedented change, and we have an unknown remainder of 2020, and we don't know as of yet what 2021 is going to look like. And you might be thinking, life is not good and will not be good for a long time, and you might be right. But here's the good news about the good life when times are bad. The good life is not dependent on circumstances. It's not dependent on whether or not we're in a pandemic. As we go through this series on the good life, we're going to look at the good fight and the good confession. But the good life has everything to do with faith, a real life-changing faith in changing times. And the good life is a godly life, and you don't have to be raised in a church to experience it. It can start today. It's a decision away. It's about Jesus. And there's no life like it because it's eternal. It's forever. The choices that you make about Jesus Christ, yes or no, are going to make a difference now and for all eternity because it is a matter of faith. But the good news is you get to enjoy that decision, that eternal destination that you can look forward to. You can enjoy that now, having peace in your heart and in your mind through any circumstances of life and yes, even in a pandemic situation. In chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, Paul uses the word good a number of times. And these will be the points of my message and the main points in this series called The Good Life. Now, I feel good about this message. I think this is going to be a good message. Okay, okay. Well, let's just get on with it, right? And start reading the scripture. I'm going to read 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 11. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pilate made the good confession, I charge you, To keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word today. Bit of review, last week Pastor Kyle looked at the first part of this series, the Good Life series, and he looked at the good fight. Now you would think there are no good fights and that all fighting is bad or wrong. And Paul in 1 Timothy is is talking about, well, there is one fight that's good, and he says the good fight, the fight of faith. And in this fight, Paul is thinking Olympic contests, Other commentators say perhaps it's a military quest. Either way, the point is the same. He he says, fight the good fight. The idea is agonize in the contest. And his understanding is for the Christian in this good fight, there needs to be a holy tension for a godly outcome. And Paul says it involves running from something and then pursuing or running to something better. Or that's good, that's godly, that is eternal. So Paul says the bad. And before verses 11, you could check it out yourself. It's wrong belief in people who push it, those who love to argue for their own sakes. And verses 4 on says, those who have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicion, and constant friction between men of corrupt minds who have been robbed of truth and those who think godliness is a means to financial gain. And Paul is saying to Timothy, run away from those guys. Run away from that thinking. It'll hurt you. And if it gets into you, it'll hurt others. 
So he says, flee, run, distance yourself. But then he says, pursue or run to some good things. And he tells Timothy to pursue and, and think intense effort. Again, agonizing, making it a point to strain forward. And he says, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. It's interesting, Paul puts um, fight and faith together as part of the good life. And we are to agonize in the struggle of faith because it is a good way to go. It's really the best way and it's God's way for each and every one of us. To agonize in the struggle of faith, it means something. It, it means everything and it's worth fighting for. So Paul says, fight the good fight. He's not talking about holy wars, but a personal quest to grow spiritually. Some people, when push comes to shove, they give up on the faith or they give up on believing. They think that Christianity is too hard or it's not worth it or that it's a waste of time. Maybe some, during this pandemic and being eight months into it, maybe you found that you really don't have need of the church and you're doing okay. So maybe you don't need God either. Maybe you could handle it and all the resources are out there and you're fine without faith or God. So you conclude that faith then is not worth agonizing over. It's not worth fighting for. And there's really nothing to pursue that God has for you to make it worth your effort. So when that happens, then the understanding is it's, it's easy to drift away and to focus on something else. To replace God or in place of God, something that might be more rewarding or personally gratifying so people can abandon the faith. Now, I hope and pray that that's not you today. But if it is, there's hope because God has not changed. He still loves you. He still has a plan for your life, and it is the good life. He loves you, and he wants you back. You can't find meaning and purpose in life without God. See, without God, you will never have the good life because he is a good God. So Paul's talking about the good fight, and here is why it's a good fight and why it's important to fight for the faith because faith keeps the man who keeps the faith. So there's a good fight. Now we move into today's message, the second good, and Paul says it is the good confession. Verse 12, so I'll be the first. Are you ready? Okay, here it goes. It's going to be a good one. Ready? Here's my confession. It's a good one. I love Jesus. <laughs> now, I know it's probably not what you're expecting. Maybe you're hoping to hear something different, uh, looking for something juicy instead, you know, the dirt of my fallen nature. Now, everyone has dirt, by the way. No one is excluded. The Bible says all of sin falls short of the glory of God. And some people's dirt is so much more terrible than ours. And we love to tell people how bad someone else is because then it makes us look better. But there's no one who is good, no one who is righteous, no one who can save themselves. Now, the context in this text that Paul is writing to Timothy has more to do with positive faith, salvation, and belief than it does spilling the beans. So I'm spared. Whew. I'm glad of that. Aren't you? Now verse 12 says, take hold of eternal life to which you were called when you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I want to look at that verse, this command phrase by phrase. The idea of take hold of eternal life to which you were called. We're going to start there. But how do you take hold of something like that? Something that is eternal. Something otherworldly. Does it even make sense? What is Paul talking about? Well, I love church signs. They seem to capture a truth and put it really small. And when I drive around Godrich and, and I go out of town, I'm always looking at the church message to see what it says. Maybe some of these will help. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Or Jesus has invested his life in you. Have you shown any interest? Choice, not chance, determines destiny. 
Or you can live in this world once, but if you live it right, once is enough. But the best thing to save for your future is your soul. And Paul is saying there's a good confession. You have to take hold of eternal life to which you were called. There's a purpose for living. And it's not just for the here and now. It's for eternity. So with verse 12 and that idea of taking hold of eternal life, some other translations might help give us the big picture. The contemporary English version says, claim eternal life. The Good News translation says, win eternal life. And going back to really an oldie goldie, the King James says, lay hold on eternal life. Eternal life is something that we can claim, we can win, we can lay hold of, we can take hold of. It's a win-win. It's good for us and God's idea is that we'd be with him forevermore. But if you don't see the faith as a fight or worth agonizing over or prioritizing in the midst of your busy, changing week, then you're not going to take hold of eternal life. Instead, you're going to be grasping and holding on to something else instead. You'll be living for yourself or things or success on a human term basis, what you can get instead of what you can give. You'll be living for others or anything but God. And it, life will just slip through your hands, and then at the end, you're going to be holding nothing. You'll miss the mark. You'll lose the plot, and you would have wasted a lot of living. Psalms 90, verse 12 says, Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Francis Chan, he's a familiar author and speaker and pastor. He shares an amazing illustration on life in eternity called The Rope. Pastor Steve showed it at our men's group meeting last Monday, and I thought it'd be worth showing today. I, we found a shortened version. It's only two and a half minutes, but it gives you a lot to think about. So let's watch that now. Imagine this rope. Okay, pretend this rope just goes on forever. Now imagine that this rope is a timeline of your existence. You just exist forever. You see this red part? This would represent your time on Earth. You've got a few short years here on Earth, and then you've got all of eternity somewhere else. And what blows me away is some of you, all you think about is this red part. It's all you think about. You're consumed with this. You go, oh man, I can't wait till here. You know, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to save, 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 so I can really enjoy this part right here. And you're consumed with that. And you're thinking, oh, man, am I going to get to travel? Am I going to eat well? Am I going to do this during this part? And I'm like, are you kidding me? What about this? What about, th what about all this stuff? It's, just, it's crazy to me because the Bible teaches that what I do during this little red part determines how I'm going to exist for millions and millions and millions of years forever. And, and so why would I spend this little red part trying to make myself as comfortable as possible enjoying myself as much as I can. Paul says, look, I'm going to live my life for this mission. I'm going to spend my life, invest my life for this moment when I cross that finish line. See, I'm going to forget about all this stuff I could enjoy. And I'm not going to look around. I'm going to be like a runner just looking at that moment when I face God. Because when I face Him, then I don't get this chance over again. We get one chance at this life on earth. And it can end at any second for any of us. We've got one chance at this, and then comes eternity. And you see, people look at some of my decisions and go, Oh, you're so stupid, because that's going to really affect this. I go, No, you're stupid, because that's going to affect all of this. Man, I, I, I'm serious. I look at the way people live, and I go, Wow, that is so crazy. You are so crazy. You're going to do that right now, just to enjoy right now. Not even knowing if you have tomorrow, and you think that's smart and that I'm dumb? Now, wasn't that a great illustration? Did it give you an idea how short life is and how forever long eternity is without end and the importance of making each day count? 
So we need to make a good confession. Paul is saying to Timothy, we need to live it. We need to believe it. We need to do it. Because how we live matters for eternity. And don't forget, we are in a good fight. There's a lot at stake. Our very lives and eternity matters. Well, the next phrase is this. When you made the good confession. Paul is telling Timothy, okay, you're saved. But there is more to uh, being saved than just saying the sinner's prayer. It's about making your faith public. And maybe you think that your faith is too personal to become public. You're going to just keep it to yourself. It's like the best kept secret. But Paul reminds Timothy, this shy young man who is just a spark, that Paul is trying to fan into flame all the good things that God has planned for Timothy. And so Paul is encouraging Timothy to fan into flame what God has put in his life and who he is in Christ and to make that good confession because of Christ's good confession. It's not an idea for self-improvement. It's like be all that you can be that God knows you can be because of what Christ has done for you. So Timothy most likely made his good confession at his baptism in water, identifying with Christ publicly. And water baptism is a special time where you make your your personal private faith public. You do it in front of other people. Now maybe you were christened or baptized or dedicated as a baby. But that was more a public expression of your parents' faith. You weren't aware of it. You were way too young. You were probably less than one year of age. And it didn't save you. In our church, we dedicate children to the Lord. But either way, an individual still needs to make a public confession of their faith. And it's amazing how much you grow when you do. When you follow in obedience in water baptism. When you confess your faith in front of others. I was baptized when I was 12 in Barrie at Howie Pentecostal Church. And I thank God for that special day. I look back. I can remember it. It's a marker in my life. I can still remember Pastor Howard Courtney and Pastor Ray Running were in the tank and I was baptized. I remember how I felt. I remember who was there. I remember why I was doing it. It was significant. It was a landmark. I will never forget it. And it meant a lot to me then. And when I look back, it means a lot to me now. And in the future, when I look back on my life as a whole, I'll remember that good confession that I made And the decision and the strength and the motivation that comes out of that to keep on living out that good confession. Well, maybe you've been baptized and you can remember that, but you've cooled off. You haven't been living daily or as you should. And I believe today God is calling you back to a deeper, growing relationship with him. See, maybe you've been baptized a long time ago. You went through the motions. Maybe you even had good reasons to do so. And it was public at that point, but you've retreated. You've backed up. And now you just live quietly and you aren't taking those opportunities that are before you to really share Christ. I want to encourage you to step up, to don't go backwards, to confess Christ. Because Christ, good confession. And that's what Paul is telling Timothy in this scripture. The good confession is so important because Christ, who was God, also made a good confession. Water baptism in New Testament times was a given. It was a normal response during this time in the Christian church, and all Christians got baptized, but it wasn't without risk. It's worth noting that. When Paul was writing these words, it was during a time when Christianity wasn't welcomed or embraced by many. And to be baptized was was taken by the Roman government to be politically rebellious. You were aligning yourself with a group considered to be fanatical and dangerous. So the Christians were considered atheists because they didn't have any images of a God that they worshipped like the Romans did. So it meant the risk of losing everything and possibly their lives. And of course the Jews had issue with the Christians and some were so threatened that they sought the lives of Christians as well. Paul, who's writing to Timothy, was one of those people. Paul was given his approval to the stoning of Stephen. And he was hunting down other Christians and imprisoning them. Paul hated 
Christians. And he thought that he was living the good life because he was religious. But he missed the point on the relationship with Jesus. And in time, he did a 180 degree change and he never looked back. Later, he would write in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. What a great verse. Often we need to be reminded of what we have confessed so we will live up to it. In Philippians chapter 3, 16, that same chapter says, Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Like, okay, you've gotten so far. Don't stop. Keep on living up to it, but keep on going. So Paul, when he's writing to Timothy, and he's speaking to us as well as Christians, he gives us three reasons why our confession is good. What we believe in shouldn't be kept a secret. And the first one is this. When we give a good confession, we follow the example of Jesus. Verse 13 says, in the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and to Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession. Did you hear that? Jesus Christ made the good confession, and he was God, and he confessed truth. He also lived truth and was truth. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Now, Pilate was the Roman ruler who interrogated Jesus by asking him, are you the king of the Jews? In Matthew chapter 27, verse 11, and Jesus said, yes, I am. In John 18, 37, Jesus also said, You are right in saying that I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. And we know that Jesus' confession cost him his life. Yet he was true to the confession of God that God had given him to make. And we win because of it. So a good confession also meant putting your life on the line in the Bible times, and even now, risking everything for Christ. And that's exactly what Christ asks each and every one of us to do, that we are to take up our cross and follow him. You know, it's, it's hard to take up a cross and not be public about your faith, or at least it shouldn't be. When you take up your cross and follow Jesus, people should take notice. Because they're going to see how you live, why you're living that way, what you believe. You're going to talk about it, but you're going to walk about it because you're taking up the cross and you're following Jesus. It's a direction that might go counter culture, uh, different from others. But that's all right because you're taking hold of eternal life. And Paul reminds us of Christ's second coming, another good reason for the good confession. He says, I charge you, To keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his time. That Christ would come back again. He's not dead in the grave. The stone has been rolled away from the tomb. It is empty. There is up to 500 witnesses at one time. Also, others that saw him ascend into heaven and he said, You see me going? I'm going to come back for you. And that is the hope of the church today. Paul believes Christ's appearing could come in his lifetime and that Timothy and all Christians should be ready and live ready. Loving Jesus and looking for his return and still today in 2020 that we should have that same desire, that same longing, that same focus that Christ could come back at any time and we should be ready and we should live that way. And although we don't know exactly when, The important thing is that we are ready, that we have things settled in our heart and in our mind and our spirit, that we've given God our life and that we choose to live for him each day as we take up a cross and follow him. The third point, the third reason to have a good confession, Paul reminds us of who God is and who God isn't. And that gives us reason to be steadfast, to be faithful, to be consistent, And to be a confessing Christian. Verse 15 to 16 reads this. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. 
See, God alone is the only true ruler of the universe. There's no one besides him, Paul is saying. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, it's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And this truth is recited daily in Jewish tradition. And there is no one like our God. He alone is God and only God. There is no one else. Now others might question your faith. They make, may make fun of you. They may think you're ignorant. But our good confession is not based on public opinion. It's based on God himself who does not change. Who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is not a man nor a man-made idea. But God is God and there is no one like him. So we should give him honor and praise and live for him. Our lives ultimately are safe in his hands. Many Christians worldwide are persecuted because of their faith, because of their good confession, because of their stand, their belief, and how they live. Their homes are burned down. They've lost their livelihood. They've been shunned from their family once they become a Christian. Many churches have been demolished and burned down. Many have lost their life. What an intolerant world that we live in today that doesn't understand God, that doesn't understand why the confession of believing in Jesus Christ is good. But there's no life like it. And so Paul is saying you have to take hold of it. There is a good confession. Eternity matters. And how you live can make a difference not just for you, but for others who look into your life, who hear you and who see you. Let me just wrap this up. You have today it is a gift from a God who loves you. His mercies are new every morning. Knowing Jesus as personal Lord and Savior is worth sharing with others. Don't keep your faith a secret. Instead, have that good confession. Let others know the hope that you have, which is so important, especially during this pandemic. Others need to know your hope. They need to see the good life that you live. And they need to put their faith and trust in Jesus, who also died for them and offers them forgiveness of sins. Let me conclude with this. Jude 20, verse 24 and 25, the most majestic New Testament benediction. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord for all ages now and forevermore. Amen. God bless and have a great day.